In our scripture lesson for this morning, it falls at the end of a long day of Jesus' teaching. Teaching the, the people around him and the scribes and the Pharisees and even some of his enemies about what it means to follow Christ, to follow God. And now he comes to his last section. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. So ends the reading of God's holy word. Let us pray. Gracious God in heaven, we ask for your understanding. We ask that you open up these ancient words, that they may become modern words to us, that we might better understand them, and that we might live by them. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So the scribe asks Jesus the big question, what is the greatest commandment? Of all the commandments we have, what is the greatest? And Jesus responds simply, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. But the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is Jesus' creed. This is what he stands on. This is what he wants his followers to stand on. Many of you have been in organizations where you have to work on mission statements and vision statements and, you know, all those types of things that we feel are so important to help people understand who we are or give us some direction. And for, to give you a little direction, the vision statement is really the, the goal where we want to go. This is where we want to go. This is our vision. And the mission, is, the mission statement is the, is the tools to which we can get to that goal, to get to that vision. That's what a mission statement is. But a creed is not that. A creed is what we stand on, what we believe in. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen at least one of the Rocky movies. There's, what, about ten of them? And believe it or not, I've seen every one of those Rocky movies. But still, my favorite is the first. And as you remember, or as you recall, the story is about the heavyweight champion of the world, Apollo Creed, giving uh, nobody a chance at the title, Rocky Balboa. And they both had creeds. Apollo, Creed, Apollo Creed's creed was to be the best heavyweight champion of the world ever. Rocky Balboa's was a little simpler. To go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the champion of the world, and at the end, when the bell rings, he's still standing. That's what his creed was. Matter of fact, he, he said it even better when he was speaking to his right, wife right before the fight. He says, all I want to do is go the distance. Then I will know for the first time in my life that I am not just another bum from the neighborhood. To be able to still stand in front of the greatest fighter of the world and know that he's done it. He wasn't asking to beat him. He was asking to say that he was able to have the strength and the courage to not give up and be somebody. A creed, again, is what you believe in, in your core. It's to strive to live up to. So what is our creed? I believe it 
unfortunately is what drives us each day it, I believe it is what commands us what kind of pounds on us which forms us our creed has been written by all the demands upon our time and the pressure upon our life that has become our creed Jesus though gives us a different creed he combines combines the ancient holy Jewish creed the Shema with another command from Leviticus now, the Shema is a very special creed for the Jews. It's the first prayer or first uh, command that a young Jewish child will learn. And they will continue to say it over and over the rest of their life. They begin their all Jewish worship, the, the Orthodox Jewish worship, always begins with the Shema. And the Shema is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. It's the one we had just read. Why, where do we get the word Shema? It comes from the Hebrew word to hear. It is the imperative word for hearing. Hear, O Israel. Shema, O Israel. That's where they get the Shema. And it is to be recited by a devout Jew first thing in the morning as they wake up and the last thing that they say when they go to bed. It is to help them stay focused on what is most important in life. To start and end the day with God on their mind. That's the Jewish creed. It helps them become a, a spiritually formed person. And maybe at the beginning, at the beginning of the day when they recite it, it helps them kind of get started for the day. Focused on God and not on all the stuff that the world is trying to put upon us. But Jesus adds something to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Just a little twist. Some of you maybe remember back in your college days or your high school days when your teacher would give you a, uh, to have you write a theme paper. You remember theme papers? I wasn't real thrilled about theme papers because I never could figure out how to get started on those things. And they're usually about 10 or 20 pages and I never had that much to say. So I usually wrote in real big letters. <laughs> double space, triple space, so I could get the 10 or 20 pages. You probably did that too. Admit it. Well, I remember one of my teachers one time, and, and some of you I know probably know the lesson too. I, I told her, I just can't get going on this thing. I, I don't know what to say. And she says, well, I, what you need to do is to figure out your theme and to write one sentence that states your theme. One sentence. It's your thematic statement. Remember that? Your thematic statement. The paper then should, she says, flow from that statement. I even know that when, when I went off to seminary and I was taking preaching classes, my preaching professor said the same thing. He said, when you're studying the scriptures and you're getting all your notes and putting it all together and you have what you think you're going to do for the sermon, then before you start writing the sermon, write your thematic statement statement what is the theme of your sermon going to be and then let everything else flow from that to love God and love others is Jesus's thematic statement and everything flowed from that rabbis cal cal calculated that the law contained 365 prohibitions 248 positive commands to the total of 613 commandments. Jesus compressed those 613 down to two. And those two expressed the meaning for all the others. The number one priority for Jesus is faith in God and love for God. From that flows the necessary and inevitable consequence of loving neighbor. For Jesus, conduct stems from faith. If you love God and you have faith in God, then it's going to flow into your life. Now, when he talks about loving your neighbor, it's 
really more of a challenge than I think many of us realize. Because when we think of neighbor, I think we think of the guy next door, or the guy I cook with, the barbecue friend, my golfing buddy. Well, those are e I can love those guys. You know, those are no problem. But if you look at the original context of Leviticus, where Jesus finds this commandment, Leviticus is saying that you are to love a fellow Jew, not a neighbor. Not to love a Gentile, definitely. Leviticus is specifically talking about you are to love someone in your community, your Jewish community. But what does Jesus do, as always? He breaks that apart. He breaks down the barriers to what a neighbor really means. Loving neighbor is easy if it's to those whom we know and are comfortable with. But Jesus shakes that definition up. And we get a much clearer picture when we read this loving neighbor command out of the Luke version of this. Because when Luke talks about loving God and loving neighbor, it is immediately followed up with the parable of the Good Samaritan. He talks about the, the command, greatest commandment is to love God and, and, and to love neighbor. But then, then he says, and then I want to tell you a parable. And it's about the Good Samaritan. And if you remember the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan gives who is my neighbor a whole other meaning. He overstepped all existing borders and, and social barriers to accomplish concrete, costly acts of love. He reached out to someone who normally wouldn't even touch him, would go on the other <coughs> side of the road. But he reached out to help. This makes it quite clear that for Jesus, loving our neighbor has no boundaries at all. If any, any ways, we should always be breaking through our boundaries to love our neighbors. Heart, soul, mind. The love of God demands the action of the whole personality. That's what Jesus is saying. All of what makes up you, your moral nature, your emotions, your intellect, your energy, all must go into one's love of God. This is what Jesus defines as spiritual formation. Maybe that is what Paul meant when writing to the Ephesians. He says this, you were taught with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on a new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Living by the Jesus creed, we will be putting off our old self and putting on a whole new self. How can this not happen? Think about it. If you love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, with your entire being, as Jesus is asking them to do, and you love your neighbor as yourself, how can you not change? You will. It may be gradual, but it will happen. One theologian said this, when we give to God a mere fraction of ourselves, God himself becomes a mere fraction of of ourselves. God himself becomes a mere fraction of what he might be to us if we give him just a fraction. And I'm afraid that many of us, all of us, there are times in our lives when we just give him a fraction. And all the other stuff around us is pushing God out of our daily life. Scribes ask us, what is the greatest commandment? What is your greatest commandment? Well, I think many of us would say, what are the immediate tasks of the day? <laughs> That's my greatest commandment, what I need to get done today. What are the deadlines? The calendars on our desk share a, a vision of what the greatest is in our life. The bills to pay, phone calls to return, appointments to keep. The cameras of our memories share what commands us. 
children to bathe, their concerts to go to, their games and practices to attend, social activities, programs, meetings that fill up our day. These are all part of our day. And I'm not saying that they're bad. They're all things that we need to do and are necessary. I remember when I was a young man, I had, and when my children were in sports and music activities, I thoroughly enjoyed going to those things and, and, and watching them and participating with them and cheering them on. And yes, we do need to pay our bills. We do need to, to uh, answer our appointments and, and do our business side of our life. We have to do those things. Those are important. But the question comes, where is God in all that? Where is God in my life? As the prayer of confession stated, we get bogged down with all the commands around us. And in the getting bogged down and stuck, the question of where is God is pushed over here. Yesterday I was at Presbytery meeting and it's not always the most exciting meeting you'd ever want to go to. But we were there and I got in a conversation with one of our pastors in San Antonio, uh, Dick Kreutzer, who is the pastor over at uh, Holy Trinity Presbyterian Church. And he told me about a ch uh, what their church has been doing the last couple of years on Ash Wednesday. He says that they have drive through ashes and I thought okay what's drive through ashes what do they drive through and you throw ashes at them or something I couldn't quite figure out what he was talking about he said well here's what we do we advertise around that if you want to come and confess your sins and confess where you've fallen short and then you want to receive ashes you know which is the symbol for confession and, and the letting go of your sins uh, you can come in your car and drive up into the parking lot and we'll give you ashes and we'll talk to you. They were shocked at how many people showed up. Most of them they had never seen, they didn't know them. But they all wanted to come and they wanted to confess. They wanted to confess things that they had done in their life. They wanted to confess that God is not that important in their life. And they want to try to change and regroup. They wanted to get back on, on target. And so they came because they wanted to start anew. I believe that there are countless people like that that want to start anew. They want to have that opportunity to start again. And I believe many of you, as your life gets so crowded with all the stuff you have to do and what the demands you have, you want to get back in with God too. And let me give you a suggestion. It's the old Jewish tradition. I'm going to challenge you that in the next five weeks, we're going to be doing this Jesus Creed series for five weeks. Every day of, that, of the five weeks, I would like for you to begin your day by reciting Jesus' Creed and end your day by reciting Jesus' Creed. And here it is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. Say this two times a day for five weeks. See what that does. See if that helps, you, helps make you more spiritually minded and spiritually formed. Maybe it begins your day with a different attitude than all the stuff we got to do today. And maybe then you can end your day with a sense of thanksgiving that God is my Lord and God is the only Lord in my life. Try it for five weeks and let's see what happens. Amen.